Education today is multifaceted and fairly complex. Built in 1878, when the first public school opened in a rented building, there was only one teacher. Ward schools served various areas of town, and in 1882, the first masonry school was built. Three other schools would be built on the same lot. The main building, 1913, the Washington Building, 1918, and Rapid City High School, 1923 and 1937. The main building would have a name change when a noteworthy visitor used the building one summer. My name is Seth Tupper. Uh, I'm the editor-in-chief of South Dakota Searchlight, which is a nonprofit uh, news website operating here in South Dakota. I live here in Rapid City. I was approached in 2014 um, by uh, an acquisitions editor for the History Press who was out looking for topics for regional history books, which is something they specialize in. And he had stumbled across some old magazine articles and things about the Coolidge summer in South Dakota and realized that there had never been a book written about it. And he was out looking for somebody to write it and he got my name somehow. And I was aware, uh, I'd read quite a bit about you know, Coolidge being here that summer, just in various books and articles and things. And so I knew it would be a great book topic. So I, I jumped on the opportunity and um, took about a year uh, to research and write the book. And, and then it came out in 2017, I think it was. So uh, just a little bit of background uh, in that, time, uh, presidents commonly um, employed something called the Summer White House, and it was in different locations, but um, Washington, D.C. is very hot and humid in the summer, and we don't notice it as much now because of air conditioning, but obviously in the 1920s and earlier, um, it was a miserable place to be in the summer, so presidents like to escape for a few weeks, a month, whatever, and go to, usually they would go to some other place on the East Coast to a summer home or whatever and, and kind of summer there and they would call it the summer white house so in 1927 um, the coolidges knew that there was a, a renovation project planned at the white house for that summer so they were going to be out for a long time the entire summer they needed to vacate the white house that was one factor the other factor was that uh, coolidge had vetoed a farm bill um, that year and it was very controversial and he, there was a feeling that he needed to go out into farm country and make amends with farmers uh, so that Republicans wouldn't have a disaster on their hands in the 1924 election. So he kind of married those two things, three things really, us needing a location for a summer White House, knowing that he, he, could, he was gonna be all, gone all summer so he could go a lot farther away, and then also needing to go into farm country. And there were several states that vied for the summer White House, but he ended up choosing uh, the Black Hills uh, in part because our congressional delegation and others lobbied pretty hard to get him out here. And it was the best of both worlds because he could um, stay in the Black Hills, which was obviously a beautiful climate and sightseeing and all that, but he could leave the Black Hills and go out onto the plains to visit farmers and ranchers, which he did um, that summer. So that's kind of how he ended up here. And he ended up staying the entire summer of 1927, about three months. So, you know, you had the, there was an old elementary school and an old high school and Coolidge took up his office for the summer in the, uh, the old Rapid City High School. And to back up a little bit, he, he stayed at the state game lodge in Custer State Park with his wife. And his routine was basically every morning, uh, a driver would take him from Custer State Park into Rapid City. He would go into the old high school where he had an office, according to reporting at the time, and it was a French teacher's classroom that they had converted into his office that had chalkboards on, on three walls and they moved in a big mahogany desk for him and that was his summertime office. So he would work in the old Rapid City High School every morning until around lunchtime and then he would go back to the game lodge and have lunch with his wife and then the afternoon was fishing or sightseeing or whatever they would were, were doing that day. My name is Joyce Bjork and I was born and raised in Rapid City and lived here till I was 23 and got married. <laughs> So I've, I've lived here most of my life. Um, so we, we've been here a long time, raised our kids here. They were little when we came. So um, I've been around a long time, watched it grow. When did you attend? Uh, we were talking before, and I, I guess I'll, I'll go through the whole role. I was going to go to second grade, and Canyon Lake School was just being built, and, but not done. So I came to Washington, which was up right up here behind Coolidge. So I went there for second grade. And so then in third grade, Canyon Lake was done. 
so I was brand new. Went there for third and fourth. By the time I was in fifth grade, the school was too small. Kind of, you hear that now too yeah. about annexes. We didn't have annexes. So third and fourth, I was out there. Then by fifth grade, it was too small. So I came back to Washington for fifth grade. And then I went back to Canyon Lake for sixth because they had room for us. So then um, I started junior high. And at that point, the junior high and the high school were all up right here. And so seventh and eighth grade, I was here. And primarily in Coolidge, the, the house or the school that's not gone, a little bit over into the main part, but not. Mostly we were in Coolidge. And in fact, we um, did some classes back up into Washington, which I was familiar with. <laughs> By then it was uh, part of the junior high and um, had had fun. I, I have fond memories of Coolidge. I mean, it was very old. I don't, I don't know when it was built, but um, a lot of it was wooden. I, I remember wide wooden stairs and the floors were wooden. And uh, it was kind of a quaint old building, but squeaky floors. <laughs> and so then um, by the time I was in ninth grade, they, it was, we were, the school was getting too crowded. So they built West Junior High. That was the first, not here, Junior High. But it was a brand new school. And uh, it was really a very nice school and kind of, fun if you'd have if if you hadn't have spent two years here yeah. so I came back then ninth grade then then 10th 10th through 12th I was here in mainly I don't think the high school kids went over to Coolidge we were pretty much all over in the main building and um, had fun staying there um, you know so so I did bounce around a lot <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, that building uh, where Coolidge had his summertime office was demolished after a 1970 fire to the elementary school that was nearby. And uh, so, the, so that's no longer here. Now, there was a portion of the current Rapid City High School that had been built. Whether Coolidge uh, ever set foot in this, this portion of the new Rapid City High School that was under construction, I don't, I don't know if he ever did. I mean, it's possible, but certainly his main activities were all in the, the old high school that ended up being torn down, unfortunately. So. My name is Gerard Brennan, and I am retired. My wife and I live in Wyoming on the western side of the Black Hills. I retired from a primarily a law enforcement career, law enforcement and construction. And uh, as far as uh, my high school years go, I attended Rapid City Central High School between 1969 and 1972. Uh, attended classes in both the main, the Coolidge, and the Washington building. Can you tell us about the fire in 1972? Oh, yes. That afternoon, I was sitting daydreaming in a class, uh, I believe it was around the second or third floor of the Coolidge building. Up to this point, it had been rather chaotic in the school. There were always things going on, always distractions and disrupting disruptions. Every once in a while, somebody, for instance, would light off a firecracker in the hallway or drop one down the stairwell in the middle of the class. Uh, it seemed like someone was pulling the fire alarm up almost every day. It was constant. And that's what happened that afternoon. The fire alarm went off. Well, our teacher uh, was pretty tired of this as well as we were. And the teacher said, according to the law, I have to let you guys leave the building, but we've been through this before. So those that want to stay and study are welcome to stay and study. But my buddies and I, were, we weren't going to spend any more time in class than we had to. So we left the building. We went right out front, right out here, and we're talking and laughing, and of course, it was about that time that uh, we heard the sirens and the fire trucks were coming up from the station right down on Main Street. And again, everyone was in a pretty jovial mood, and then all of a sudden, we saw that there was smoke coming from the roof of the Washington building. It was real. 
And so the crowd started to shift in that direction. Um, it didn't take long before some of my buddies and I decided that we had to act, we had to do something because at the time I was in my junior year and I was a staff photographer for the yearbook and I was the photo editor of the uh, newspaper, newspaper being the pine needle, the yearbook was called the pine cone. Now our journalism and photography uh, section was in the bottom level of the Washington building of which smoke was coming out of. Um, our photo lab was in the back of the classroom. Now that part of the building was at the lowest level on the north side and it actually was a walkout level. Well to begin with I went over there and I run into some of my photography and journalism buddies and uh, the first thing we did is we thought we needed to go in and see what the fire looked like from the inside. So we opened the uh, outside door on the lowest level and we went up the stairs past our classrooms, the, the journalism rooms I should say, the yearbook room. <clears throat> we went up the stairs and we got into the main open, open area of the Washington building and all of a sudden this heavy black cloud of just thick smoke just hit us like a wall and down the store down the stairs it and we came and we stumbled when we got to the lower stairs we rolled out hit the panic bar on the door we rolled out onto the ground and then we realized hey we've got all of this camera equipment uh, enlargers and, and uh, a lot of a lot of valuable things that were still in the yearbook and newspaper room and the laboratory, the photo lab. So we thought we needed to get them out, but there was no going back in the way that we came. So we started breaking windows out of the, the Washington building on the bottom. Some of us jumped in and started handing out cameras, enlargers, all kinds of processing equipment, one thing or another, anything we could get our hands on as fast as we could, handing them out the windows to the other guys who grabbed the stuff and laid it out on the lawn. Well, it was about that time that a bunch of firemen came charging us, charging up, and they were really angry. They started yelling at us, saying that we were venting the fire and making the building burn a lot faster. And pretty much removed us from the area. <laughs> so then we got that equipment out of there and I got my uh, camera equipment and I just started going around snapping pictures. Luckily, Stevens High School had been open in the 1969-1970 school year, so the Rapid City High campus wasn't nearly as crowded as in past years. Because of the 1970 fire, the Washington and Coolidge building were torn down and the school district asked the community to rebuild. After a failed 1971 bond, the Rapid City community said yes in 1973. And Central High School, as we know it, was completed in 1977-1978. I am Rhonda Lipp. I am the Principal Secretary here at Rapid City High School. A former student back in uh, 1977, fall of 1977, started my sophomore year here. Oh, I was so excited as a, a sophomore. Um, you know, my sister had been here, and so, you know, it was pretty exciting, you know, feeling like you're finally that big kid, you know. Um, I just remember the stairs and, you know, going up and down the stairs and um, being in the auditorium. And then when we left and we walk into this brand new building, the, the design is completely, totally different. Everything is open and yeah, kind of miss the old building. And then as a secretary of, of the building, a principal secretary, I've learned a lot um, from giving class reunion tours. Um, they'll, the former classmates will tell me, uh, you know, well, there was an orchestra pit here. I'm like, um, there's no orchestra pit anymore. I think that's gone. 
Oh, that was so sad. <laughs> um, the choir room was gone and the band room is gone, but we have classrooms there now. And then the, the, uh, the backstage was extended for the performing arts. Students moved out of Rapid City High School, which became Dakota Junior High the following year, with help from almost $1 million in economic development funds. My name is Sharon Rose and I taught in Rapid City for 20 years um, science and about five years of family and consumer science and most of that was at Dakota Middle School. Um, some of the reasons that I loved working here, I loved the architecture in the building and um, our kids went to school here. I, I loved the school for them because I always say the whole world went to school at Dakota. We had different economic groups. We had um, English as a second language was taught here. So I, they met Chinese students, Vietnamese students. I had them, those students in my classes. Um, but, and then parents would come and say, oh, this is, I'm afraid to send my kid to high school. It's such a big school and I said, no worries, this is a large campus, they'll adapt to that, and as I said, the whole world, they'll find a group that they fit in, and if their upbringing was right, they will assimilate into those good groups that, that will make them happy. In 2011 to 2012, Rapid Valley's growing population warranted the building of East Middle School. This allowed the large downtown building again to be repurposed. This time, the alternatives program could finally be unified and centrally located. I'm Chris Bierke. I work for Architecture Incorporated and I was uh, one of the architects on the addition renovation project in 2010 through 2012. And I'm Jeremy Altman. I also work as an architect with Architecture Incorporated and I'm currently a volunteer on the Historic Preservation Commission for Rapid City, I guess. Well, I've lived in Rapid for, oh, since um, the 80s and uh, I've driven by it occasionally um, when it was Dakota Middle School, there might may have been events in the auditorium. But my first really good look at it was when you know, our company got the contract to design a new addition and renovate the theater. The school district uh, initially uh, hired us for a study whether it was feasible to uh, have a third high school here and uh, renovate the auditorium into a modern performance space. and. Uh, so the school was working with um, the Performing Arts Coalition. Vision 2012 grant from the city. And uh, so it was a partnership between the Performing Arts Coalition, the city, and the school district, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, so the money that the Performing Arts Coalition got to renovate the theater the city or the school district paid for the renovation of, you know, all four floors uh, to make it into Rapid City High School. So we had two additions. We had the addition onto the theater, which were theater support spaces, box office for the, the studio theater, uh, the box theater that was also built. And uh, then the administrative classroom, which is on what, a east side, would you say? That side? Yeah. So that's, that's what we were hired to do. At the time, the school district didn't have a set of the original blueprints for the building. And so we had to come and measure everything. And um, there were inexplicable things happening, you know, like the floor levels were different from room to room. Because now where you'd pour a whole floor slab and then put up the framing, they would put up the framing and then room by room, you know, put in the floor. And they were wood floors. It's not like they were pouring concrete. 
and um, all just a little different. So um, that was interesting. Everything was just a different thing. Yeah. And then, you know, trying to reconcile inside dimensions with outside dimensions. And we found several places where they had actually built in whole second walls for, for whatever reason. I don't know, but. Um, oh no, it was, it was very much, you know, community awareness and, you know, awareness of the past because so many people came forward who were, you know, had attachments to the school and told stories and, you know, offered, you know, like the, like the construction photos, you know, and things like that. And so interesting. And you, and you go through and, um, uh, you know, an, another interesting thing I think was the um, orchestra pit in the, the old theater. They had since closed it, but there's an actual pit that there was like little stairs and it was under the stage and just a little out in front. And uh, they had closed it off, long since closed it off because it was considered dangerous and it wasn't accessible. And when we were redoing this, the stage, it covered the, the pit, okay. <laughs> which, was, which was traumatic for some people because in the pit, Everyone who had ever been in a play or the orchestra had, you know, written graffiti on the walls of the pit. And that's still down there, but it's, you know, it got filled in with gravel, you know, to, you can't get to it anymore, but there are pictures of it. Oh. I don't have any, but pictures were taken of all the graffiti and the old space. And that was interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm Ron Reed. I have a doctorate in theater. I've had two major uh, uh, changes in life. One was in theater, you know, where I had a PhD and I was head of departments of theater at USD and at Purdue. And then I came back to South Dakota because I have a handicapped daughter. I had left South Dakota because there were no programs for her. They wanted us to put her in Redfield and institutionalize her, and we refused to do that. Um, so we pursued other opportunities for her, which took me to Purdue University, where they had a program for infants to adults in special needs. And so I got a call from Governor Knight asking me to come back to South Dakota and head the Department of Education and Cultural Affairs for the state and in, implement special ed in the state of South Dakota. And I did, and I've been here ever since. Well, my first introduction to Rapid City High School was with this part of the building. Um, that the, uh, there was a, a gift from the city to increase the capacity of the arts in Rapid City. And, um, and this became available. The superintendent at the time went to the mayor and said, what about this part of the building? Because it wasn't going to be used by the school district. And the mayor thought it was terrific for historic preservation and wanted to retain it. And so he kind of pushed the fact that the state was, or the city was putting money into the facility and this is what they wanted us to do. So we went, that wasn't much of a choice. It was city money. <laughs> so, so we came here and started a remodel of the, of the building, which was going to be remodeled, but the theater had its own remodeling team. Uh, and then we added on to the back end of the building here for offices, a, a small studio theater rehearsal spaces, costume, all of those kinds of ads were put into the construction of this part of the building. So when we took over this space, the proscenium arch that you can see here was built when the building was created, but it had been chipped up and knocked out and all kinds of pieces missing. Along the perimeter walls are little figures of of individuals up there on the wall and all the noses had been taken off. 
broken up by students over the years. All the seats were wooden seats like they are in the balcony. And it seated about 800 in here, but it was not comfortable for seating and we needed more space for the stage. So the, in the, uh, the, the program, there was an orchestra pit when you're sitting over the top of it right now, but it required us to create a new orchestra pit back over here and make it handicapped accessible and that would have taken even more seats out of, out of here. So our orchestras are on the stage performing either in the wings or backstage. So the symphony performs here as well as do other groups in the community up here. So it's become a real community arts center aside from the civic center that's more affordable. I am Deb Steele. I am a 30 year veteran of the Rapid City Area Schools, um, elementary, and then went to the alternative program in 1994 and worked my way up to the principal. I was a principal probably for the last 12 years of uh, my career and I retired in June of 2016. It was crazy. Um, it was difficult. We had 11 programs in multiple buildings around town and we had no additional staff allowed. So we had to take all of those teachers and staff and somehow merge totally different programs into Rapid City High School. And so it took a lot of work, a lot of teachers hours of, you know, discussions and what are the best practices in each one of our programs because we didn't want to lose anything. And so we continued once we moved in in 2013, we continued as an alternative program that didn't grant diplomas that but allowed students to graduate from their home high school at Central or Stevens where they could pick up electives and things that we didn't offer. Uh, you know, especially like sports, band, orchestra, those types of things. We were not ever supposed to be the third high school because we didn't have the staff and the school district didn't have the funds uh, or the ability to build a third high school. So that's why we repurposed uh, what was Dakota Middle School, originally Rapid City High School. It came back to its full glory, really. Uh, what is your favorite part of this? You know, I, it's so hard to say because I love old buildings, but they used uh, geothermal heating. So we're so energy efficient. The windows, everything is 21st century, but the paint colors, the wood colors, everything are original to when it was built in 23. They made sure that they redid uh, the beautiful things um, outside of the theaters, you know, in the foyer. They took that false ceiling down and found all of that work there intact. So, I mean, it's, it's just the beauty of being an old building that has had all the tender loving care that it needed and brought back to its glory and it'll be here for years. My name is Jennifer Roberts and I am the current principal at Rapid City Alternative Academy. What is Rapid City Alternative Academy? Rapid City Alternative Academy is a building that houses some alternative programs for students that find the traditional school is not a great fit for them. And so we have a number of different programs in this building. Um, one of them is the Eagles Path Program. Uh, one of them is the Virtual High School and um, there are some other things here as well, including the GED program, uh, homebound and long-term suspension expulsion. This building functions very well for uh, the students and the staff that are here. Um, there are many benefits to being in, you know, right downtown in such a beautiful place. We have wonderful views from the building. Um, we have just a beautiful environment for learning and I do feel like the students and the staff really appreciate that. And it feels good to be a part of such a nice tradition. And there's so many classic elements in what people think of as a school building. Um, everything from the uh, 
wood uh, seats in the old gymnasium uh, to the terrazzo floors to the woodwork and um, the huge windows and it just feels like that traditional learning environment in school and it's just a beautiful place to be and I feel like that makes a big difference in what we're able to do and how students learn. Um, I feel like having an alternative option is really important for our students um, because we know that um, some of the things that uh, work for learning do not work for everyone. And so it's great that there is another option for students and families um, because uh, research does show that having a high school diploma um, helps people have a longer, happier, healthier life. And of course, we want that for all of the citizens of Rapid City. And we know that that impacts our students, the families that they already have, the families that they will have in the future. And so it's just a wonderful thing for our whole community when everybody can have that kind of an education. It's a blessing to all of us and so to be able to have it in such a great environment and kind of carry on the legacy of education the hundred years of education that's already happened in this building and knowing that that's continuing today and will continue into the future um, I think it gives us a continuity even knowing how much education has changed over the years and you think about how everything has changed from communication um, when this building first was here you know a lot of people didn't have telephones. And then you think about how it came when people had the switchboard operators and um, even when I was a kid my grandparents still had a party line and um, now almost nobody has a regular telephone in their home that's all on cell phones. So you think about those changes in technology and the changes and what's out there but thinking about the continuity of this building and that piece of education and that's really a nice thing for people to have and kind of to hold on to. We have a lot of shared memories and a lot of um, shared experiences and I think this provides a place for students and for the community and kind of an anchor for Rapid City.